Uh, in the uh, pastures where the sheep graze, and by golly, the ducks ate up the grubs on which the pestilence lived and didn't die, they survived, and the sheep came right back up again. And the king came to, to Christie, had Christie come to the palace and he said, uh, Dr. Wilson, you have saved uh, my country economically. I will let you build a Christian church. And when we were there a year ago, Thanksgiving, we had duck for Thanksgiving. Uh, 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 he, and he was telling us this story. Um, outside, uh, they were beginning to build that church. They had these huge 60-foot I-beams brought 1,500 miles away from Bombay over the Khyber Pass, where the Charge of the Light Brigade had been uh, brought by tank and by ox cart up, up there to Afghanistan. And they're hastily putting up this church. And Christie had sense enough not to try to make it Christie's church, but Christ's church. And he had 11 different Protestant denominations come in and they made the Kabul Community Church and they dedicated it on the 17th of May a year ago. Uh, uh, then, uh, then incidentally there was a, a Roman Catholic there and they were only allowed to, to worship in his, in his home. They couldn't uh, have a church there. And he took sick and Christy told me that uh, he had to go back to Rome for a very serious operation but he only had money enough to go one way. And the Protestants all chipped in and bought him uh, half his ticket. All I said from Afghanistan to Rome. No, they said it was part of the round trip ticket. And he survived and he came back and he was so grateful for Protestants that he brought back a wooden lectern from St. Peter and that was set up in this, uh, this church, the church that Duck built. <laughs> and he, used to, and he uh, used to give the sermons from that. Sermons from that. But there's a sad ending to the story. Uh, just last March, just at this time, a new, a, prime, a, a, a new minister, a prime minister came in and threw over, overthrew the king. And since they are 95% Muslim and he wanted to curry the favor of the people, he ordered the church torn down. And they came in and they tore down the church. Christie was banished. They gave him a week to get out. The awfully sad thing was that uh, he had a, uh, an institute there for blind people, about 100 blind people. I lectured to him once. It was fascinating. I did the dust can, for example. They were just fascinated by it. And what they would do uh, in a room like this, they'd wait to hear the top hit and then hit the floor. And they just, hoo, hoo, ha, <laughs> Then I'd do it again. <laughs> and then I did another trick that is very interesting for you to do. When you're talking about qualitative analysis, you can't see those ion anions and cations. And how do you find they're there? Yeah. Give them little match boxes or little uh, pill boxes, and these have about five different kinds. Uh, some with uh, paper clips in, some with corks in, some with a little piece of lead or stone in it, some with a little vial of water in, some with a little, little, little copper, uh, cotton with perfume in, and pass them out. And they can't open them up, and they have to shake them and smell them and weigh them and try to guess what's in them. And it's lots of fun. You have a class of 30. You have 30 of the, say, five different kinds, six, uh, and pass them around. So each one gets about two minutes to guess what's in those boxes. It's an awfully nice experiment uh, to do. Anyway, and I did that with the blind people. It was, it was very exciting. Well, that's the story of the church that ducks built. Now, the last story is the one about me. Uh, the story about me is the uh, uh, story about my tops. I'm not going to project it or show you any experiment, but I will show you essentially what it is. I've la worked, this is my baby for the last 10 years. Um, I did it because, well, it's, uh, the two stories I'll tell you. It was George Kistakovsky, how I got into writing these lecture demonstrations, not my tops, but just macro lecture demonstration. I published a book with 4,000 men. How did I get into it? The importance of the irrelevancy. Because George Kistakovsky up at Harvard was asked to lecture to the freshmen. Now, if you know George, you couldn't think of more of an anachronism. Every time he opens his mouth, an integral sign comes forth. And yet, <laughs> here he had to lecture to a bunch of Radcliffe girls, 250 girls, that weren't the slightest bit interested in chemistry. And he had been in Princeton. I knew him quite well, as a matter of fact. And he wrote down, he says, Hubert, he says, I don't know what to do. I've got to lecture to these girls in freshman chemistry. I haven't had ke freshman chemistry for 40 years. I don't. But I remember the exciting experiments he used to do. Well, you write them all up. I'll pay for the secretarial help and everything. And then I'll make that my course. We won't we'll use a book or anything. And so on little cards, this was back in 1947, on little cards I wrote, I found out I did about 650 experiments. And I wrote, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, 
exothermic reaction. And then in little letters, what the assistant put out, uh, dropping a bottle of mercury and uh, uh, iodine flakes and a mortar and pestle. And then in capital letters, what the professor did, because he couldn't see very well, so the big capital letters. And it said, take uh, in the water, take one drop of uh, the mercury, one tiny flake of iodine, and keeping your face at a distance, grind carefully. Well, it forms a uh, mercuric iodide, and it's exothermic, and the bond is so uh, uh, weak, you see, it immediately dissociates, and up comes a puff of iodine smoke, you see. And George said, well, uh, he said, uh, this is my course. I would come in and say, well, let's, let's see what Doc Adair has for us today. And I'd take it. I'd never do him beforehand. He said, I didn't think I was giving Mother Nature a sporting chance. <laughs> I'd come in, and he said, let's see what Doc Adair And I'd look and see, and I'd do the experiment. If it worked, we'd bless you and go on to the next card, he said. But if it didn't work, we'd spend the rest of the hour trying to find out why it didn't work. And they'd learn an awful lot of chemistry from George by doing this. So he said, I, I, I came one day, and I saw this exothermic reaction. And he said, I saw there was a dropper, but I didn't bother to read it very carefully. He says, I unscrewed the, uh, the cup, and I poured the mercury into the puff. I took the iodine, and I dumped it in. He says, the girls, it says here's an exothermic reaction. Boom! He says, it covered me from head to foot. This huge cloud, like an atom bomb, went up to the ceiling. 250 girls jumped to their feet in alarm. I said, girls, you've seen an exothermic reaction. The class is dismissed. <laughs> he said, it was the shortest and the most dramatic lecture I ever gave. <laughs> Well, then I went to Hawaii right after that for a, a year, and they wanted me to set it up out there, and I did, and I began rewriting it. Pretty soon, I had these 650 experiments written up pretty well, and I came back, and I thought, this is a shame. Uh, uh, all these chemicals, how to do it and everything, I got it all written up, I ought to publish it. And I asked the editor of the journal, chemicals, yeah, I think I'm associated with them, and maybe I could contribute a series. He says, go to it. Well, we began to publish it. Before we knew it, uh, we kept on and on and on. We went on for about 15 years, and, and Fred Dutton came in with me, and in the end, we published about 4,000 different macro experiments. Then I went to Belgium, and now we come to the second, uh, the importance of irrelevancy. I went to Belgium, and there uh, I lectured uh, oh, every three or four times a day. And uh, up on the wall, I projected what I was saying. I lectured in bad French. But there were also Flemish people there, Dutch people. And I would project up on the wall. I would have an overhead projector, and my assistant would grind. And up on the wall, in pink, would come uh, the carbon and say, Noir! And they'd look up in there, they'd see the carbon. Uh, and then in Dutch, you see, uh, you know, the Dutch was yellow, and the, and the French was pink. And then I'd say something else. Then he'd, come, then he'd look and see what it was. Well, this is the way I liked it. But when I was not uh, lecturing to the public, I did something that every one of you who is a high school student, I beg you to listen carefully to what I have to say now. Every one of you should be doing some little research. Uh, it may not be super sophisticated, but it should be every week of your life, you should be doing two or three hours minimum of research. You say, well, I don't know what to do. I, uh, we can make up a list of things like that instantly to keep you busy the rest of your life. Uh, if I want to know what to do, oh, I'll dry some, I don't know, soybeans. Can you dry soy? Lima beans, I don't know. What it is. <laughs> I take some soil <laughs> and I draw it at, at soil at different pHs, a soil at different amounts of water. I uh, brought it capped over with, uh, with an uh, atmosphere with 80% uh, oxygen, with 50% oxygen, with 21% uh, oxygen. That wouldn't be ha hard. 5% oxygen. See how fast they grow. Uh, grow them with nitrous oxide which behaves like oxygen. Maybe you get laughing beans. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 all these other different uh, things you can do with ultraviolet light, with, with light that orlinates every two hours. Of, uh, some little research like that. Uh, do that with your best students, and your class gets so excited as you discover various things. And this is what they do with my TOPS thing. I issue this uh, the second term to my non-science students, and they have to invent experiments. I'll tell you one example. For, uh, what a non-scientist uh, did, he did electrolysis on a couple of wires, and the silver plated out. And then he said, you know, I like the silver plate silver diamine. You know how you take silver chloride and dissolve an ammonia and form a complex. I wonder what it plate. Well, it came out, instead of it plating out as silver, it floated like a lily pad. I said, all right, let's do it this way. They took a, we took a clock a glass and filled it with a, uh, the diamine chloride, silver diamine chloride, and two wires. Like, and it began to grow out like this in the most beautiful leaf-like fashion. And then I cut this so this was hanging by itself. And this one started to grow out. And when the new one hits this metallically, <laughs> it exploded from the ends here. Oh, it was just fascinating. He was, Logan was his name. Uh, he was supposed to come in only three hours a week. 
uh, the lab was only open six hours a week. He came in six hours a week, ran from Easter right through until June. And he was a C student in Easter, and he got 98 on the final exam. He was that excited uh, by this that he had discovered. And you should do the same sort of thing. And so when I was in, in, in Belgium, when I was lect wasn't lecturing to the public, in the back room I designed the auditorium and the room in back, so I had vacuum and everything else you could think of in the back room for me. Very necessary for the public, I told the, uh, the Belgians. So, but I had some work to do. And, I, and so back there, I was doing experiments. I, I thought, uh, uh, I think I'll do some experiments with a projector, do experiments. And in those days, you had a projector, uh, a horizontal stage like that, and you put petri dishes. You could do titration or, uh, or change of colors. Or you could even put uh, a double cell uh, and do electrolysis uh, uh, with a double cell like this uh, on the stage uh, of an uh, uh, ordinary slide projector. The only trouble was only the Chinese students in your class understood what was happening because it came upside down on the screen. <laughs> and then I thought, well, gee whiz, maybe if we could take, and this was, the, uh, this was the flash that made all the difference in the world, and the lucky accident, because I, using the projector, I was working out in the back room, the lucky accident, the, by golly, if I make the stage of the projector vertical instead of horizontal, as always been, then all the things I do macro, I can put on the, the projector. And all these 4,000 experiments I've published, I'll see which ones can be projected. And it turned out that at least 1,000 can now be projected. Uh, and I'll show you the kind of thing you can do. I'm not going to project it. For example, and there's a little kit, and this is what the teachers are using tomorrow. And so a little kit this size uh, cost about uh, cost less than twelve dollars, and complete chemical laboratory that you can use from the sixth grade right through uh, to to the first year of non-science uh, college chemistry. And uh, uh, the amount of stuff broken each year would be about 50 cents a year to replace the stuff. And uh, for example, uh, it, it revolves around a, a lovely little cell like that. You do all, the, all your reactions in a cell like this. And thus you would do, uh, you'd fill this with dilute sulfuric acid, fill that with dilute sulfuric acid, and invert it like that. And now you just take and put a battery to it, and you'll get two volumes of hydrogen, one volume of oxygen. And when it's about half generated, turn it around, and now you'll get oxygen, hydrogen, both of them. And then you take it out in the lighter, pop, and it explodes, pop, and goes back down. Or uh, if you were going to, if you're going to generate oxygen, for example, you had something like this, and you put a little burner, have a little micro burner. I think, yeah, I had one here. Put the micro burner under it here, you see, and your potassium chloride in here, and you heat this, and, and then you have a little tube to catch the gas. Going. You do all these different things with, with uh, the tiniest little bit of junk that you can imagine. I'm going to, and this is my tops. Uh, I see I t the tested demonstration. These were the tested overhead. Uh, projections there. And I'll do one experiment here, which you can probably see even though uh, I'm not going to project it. I'll put some, this is so, sodium uh, hydroxide with a little phenylthalein in it. And I'm going to blow in there, and I'm going to titrate uh, that sodium hydroxide uh, with my breath. Oh, by the way, you put these on the stage of a projector. I pre developed one projector that cost $400, another projector that cost about $40, another projector that cost uh, $15, and one projector that cost 20 cents. And the 20 cent one is not bad for the developing country. Uh, uh, I showed it out at Bozeman, Idaho, and, uh, 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 and uh, 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 Montana once at the 4,000. Uh, teachers and the man in the back row said, I saw it just as plainly. Here it is. This is my 20 cent projector. That's a projector. Now, uh, you, know you know these uh, 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 tensor lamps that you can read by? When you get home, if you have one of these tensor lamps with, that has a bulb like this, you take and paint over it as I have, leaving a little window. Or simpler still, if you have a youngster showing this, take a little piece of aluminum foil and make a, a little hole, a little smaller than a dime, and press it against the bulb. And it becomes like a pinhole projector, a pinhole camera. You don't need any lenses or anything. Put a transparency here and a white wall here, and you move this back and forth to focus it, and you'll get it in color. And this is my 20 cent projector. And in the developing country where I went, I said, you just uh, cemented uh, two wires here, solder two wires here, throw it out the window, attach it to a friend's Jeep, and hope he doesn't drive away during the class. And, you have, and then what I use there, I have a cell, so I would put my cell here, I'd put this here, I'd put this here, the cell, and right here I'd put some wax paper or onion skin paper, and I have rear view projection. It does very well. Anyway, I'm going to do one experiment here, then we're almost done, because I want to just tell just a couple more things. I'm going to blow in there. I've done this so many times that I actually can tell. I can tell it when I project it better than this, um, how many blows it takes for the carbon dioxide to neutralize the hydroxide and the phenol to turn colorless. And as I'm looking at it now, there's not very many. It's going to take, uh, it's going to take 15 blows, 15 blows. Go absolutely colorless in 15 blows. Five. 
10, 12, 13, 14. One more. It goes completely, completely colorless. <laughs> completely colorless. <you> see. <laughs> now that's only fun because that is real. Well, that gives you some idea of the importance of the irrelevancy of, of many things that happen to uh, me during the course of my life. I'll end, though, by telling you something. Up in Maine, where some of my ancestors come from, uh, buried there, uh, um, there is a, there's a tombstone. Uh, I just told you, told you about all that I'm doing, you see, so you know. And if you want to know any more about it, write to me at Princeton, just Hubert Allier, uh, Chemical Laboratory, Frick Chemical Laboratory, it's called F-R-I-C-K, but just Chemical Laboratory, Princeton. I have a brochure that can tell you a, a lot more about uh, this. Uh, anyway, the, uh, 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 this uh, 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 stone in the cemetery reads as follows. Stay, stranger, let me counsel you. Uh, where you are now, I once was too. Where I am now, you soon will be. So haste not on, come, follow me. <laughs> but somebody had penciled beneath. <laughs> to follow you, I'll not consent <laughs> until I know which way you went. <laughs> 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 I've told you which way I went. Come, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. I told, I told this last night, so I think I'll tell it to you or you'll, you'll feel cheated. The story about the dinosaur. Um, uh, nerve impulses go very, very slowly, less than 100 feet a second. And the dinosaur was so huge, 150 feet from stem to stern, and if somebody started nibbling at his uh, tail, and the warning as it came out, you better run, no, you better turn around, jump a tree, no, uh, call for help, no, roll over, and they're very heavy in the sand, no, call for help, there's your brother over there. By the time it had come down, his spinal column all the way to the back of his spine, then out to his tail, maybe his tail would be eaten up half. To, to, and this is true, to defend himself, the dinosaur defended, uh, developed a second brain at the base of his spine. He had a, a brain up here and a brain down here. Some of my Princeton students have only this rudiment left. <laughs> and, uh, and the story about the dinosaur goes as follows. Behold the mighty dinosaur, famous in prehistoric lore, not only for his weight and strength, but for his intellectual length. You'll observe from his remains, the creature had two sets of brains, one at his head, the usual place, the other at his spinal base. Thus he could reason a priori, as well as a posteriori. No problem bothered him if he could make both head and tail, of, and if one brain found the pressure strong, he passed a few ideas along. If something slipped the forward mind, it was rescued by the one behind. And if in error he was caught, he had a saving afterthought. So wise was he, so wise and solemn, each thought just filled a column, a spinal column. For he could think without congestion upon both sides of every question. Oh, gaze upon this noble beast, de ten million years, at least. <laughs> so. <laughs> I should. I should tell you, when, when, Dr., uh, when Dr. Jacobson brought me up from Des Moines, I passed through a little bit of a town at midnight, and you wouldn't even know it was there, except there was a, I think it was a Baptist minister lived there, and he had this great big sign in neon, and you could read it a mile away before you get to the town. You'd have gone right through the town if it hadn't been, but there was this big sign, and it said on it, uh, it said on it, uh, uh, if you're t uh, in front of the church, it was, if you're tired of sin, come in. <laughs> But somebody had written on it uh, in lipstick. <laughs> if not, <laughs> call Dot Ames five seven six seven. Come on, before they throw me out.
son was about three years old, and I bought a lot of copies of, of uh, Poetry Magazine with a picture of Einstein. He was there like this, so he was hypnotized by Mrs. Einstein. And she looked at that, that's why I looked at that. Once we meet with Einstein, I'm just amazing. Well, Einstein moved to Princeton. And Trudy was playing out front of the uh, Royal Ontario Lesson Theater, and along came Einstein, because he lived near it. And Trudy beamed and said, Einstein, I'm not sure sure enough. He said, Daddy, is that Mrs. Einstein with the big hair? And he said, Yeah, that's Mrs. Einstein. And then they're walking out. Well, then uh, uh, later, he was walking down to uh, where uh, the uh, uh, golf course was. And he was walking past, and Trudy was playing the boat. And he took the boat across the sea, and Einstein was stuck in the, in the grass. Story. I've uh, um, about speaking, French. speaking French. Oh no, I won't tell that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I tell you what. Uh, sorry, um, I've had contact uh, with four Nobel Prize men. I was the last student Swanti Arrhenius ever had. It was too much for him. <laughs> uh, God, that was when I was uh, 20, just going on to 21, over at Nobel Institute. And then I studied with Haber and I wrote three papers with him. Then I uh, worked, uh, well, I was Wigner, in fact, brought him to Princeton, and then finally uh, with Pauling and uh, uh, out of Caltech. And each one is so different that I think I ought to tell you this to tell your students, show how human people are. Einstein was just like a young boy. He, though he, at that time, he was in his late 60s. He would come over, oh, what you doing today, Mr. Adye, so-and-so. Oh, that's interesting. And now you're going to give us so-and-so? Well, I hadn't even thought of it, but I'm no fool. I said, yeah, I'm going to do it this afternoon. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll come back and see how you do it tomorrow. And I'm sure he walked over and said, gee, that American boy is awful bright. He always thinks of the things before I do. <laughs> always an angle, you know. <laughs> But then, uh, then, then Haber, uh, four years later, completely different, the stern Prussian. I had my PhD now. Come in. Ah, Herr Doctor, was hast du getan heute? Ah, sehr interessant. Aber, but, aber. I think I ought to write a, an article. Aber, Haber, aber. Always questioning. Always questioning. Haber, aber. Have you done this? Aber, have you done this? Uh, then um, uh, Pauling is the one I wanted to tell you about. Uh, uh, he would come in. Uh, what are you doing now? We're both professors now. Uh, this is just 10, 15 years ago. What are you doing now? Oh, that's interesting. And off would go as cool. I'll help you. And, and he'd work along with me. Now, the thing I wanted to tell you about was that Pauling was in our house. And don't think I'm boasting. The one thing I think that boys soon learn is that I reverence these people tremendously. But you get across to them something that I got across that has helped me enormously all my life. And that is, these great people want to see you because you know something they don't. Uh, for the moment, you're more of an authority on something that they are. It doesn't mean that you don't reverence them, uh, but it means uh, that uh, you spend the time without being afraid of them. I had an hour's interview with Jean Kai Schock and the madam. I had a wonderful time. The minister of education says, oh, professor, the things you said to him, I'd have gotten thrown out of <laughs> my job tomorrow. I said, but it had to be said. He says, yes, that's true, and I'm so glad you said it. And I lectured to Tito for an hour, for five, uh, four and a half minutes, and was very careful not to explode a bottle of hydrogen oxygen <laughs> with those 40 guards standing around the summer. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, as I had a wonderful time with him because I wasn't, wasn't afraid. They said he laughed for the first time in the Zagreb Fair when I, he'd been there for an hour and hadn't smiled once. And he laughed. He said, what do I, at that bubbling, what do I do if I swallow that professor? Oh, <laughs> he said, enjoy our country. I looked at that fellow and said, how can you live? at night when you realize you've killed a million people. And then I thought, ah, yes, but you know that you have saved a million people, uh, two million people, because he had a Serbian wife and he was Croatian, and he brought them together and united as a United Nations instead of civil war. And, and so these, these great people, uh, I don't think that they're, they're that wonderful. I think they're, that you admire them enormously for what they have accomplished in the world, but you find they're very, like, uh, like uh, Walt Disney. Uh, when I went out there, I was out there, I was with him the whole day from 9 in the morning until 4 that afternoon, and I remember after dinner, he uh, said, oh, I want to see, you want to see my, uh, my uh, uh, um, 
monorail, and he took me, he climbed up into the uh, cabin of it, and he says, and you pull it like this, and you pull it like this, you pull it like that. And I saw this mighty great man sitting there uh, with a blister nose of this uh, million dollar toy that he was playing with, like a father would play with his a $15 toy train Christmas afternoon. I said, you better look out, Mr. Disney, if you play any more, you'll get, you'll learn the railroad. Oh, he says, Doc, I already own two railroads. You see. Well, but the thing I want to talk about, Pauling, and then I'll stop. Uh, Paul, believe it, you won't believe it, but I will. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, pa uh, Pauling and his wife, were, uh, we used to go out there about three times a, a, a week when I was at Caltech during the summer. It was about four months I was with him. Uh, well, because he was writing his freshman text and he would dictate it. I'd go out and listen to it. On the, and I didn't, uh, he hadn't taught a great deal and I didn't know very much either, but together, well, he made perfect ass of ourselves. And so, <laughs> so, so uh, we, <coughs> uh, uh, he was at our house in Princeton. He was going to give a series of lectures that week. Uh, when he won the Nobel Prize for the chemical bond in 1954. And uh, that morning I said, uh, I said, uh, uh, wouldn't it politeness, well, how about coming over to dinner tonight? Uh, just Evelyn and I and you and your wife. He said, oh, he said, that's the finest thing I've heard this morning. He said, ever since I got the Nobel Prize, everybody is calling me up all over Princeton and wants me to come to a big dinner. So they have a great big dinner. I just love to come. We'll come over. So the two of them came over and they were with us that evening quietly. And the interesting thing was they were just as happy as children. Not because he was getting the Nobel Prize, this is the interesting and human thing, but because they, that morning they had sent cablegrams off to their children, the four children. They had had a summer together for about two and a half weeks as a family, a very closely knit family, and they had parted. Uh, Peter had gone uh, to England, he's still there. Uh, uh, Linda had gone to Norway. Uh, 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 Crellin had gone up to Reed College, and the other had gone to Hawaii, and they sent uh, t uh, cablegrams to him, come to, uh, come to Stockholm on the 10th of December, Dad's won the Nobel Prize, and we'll have a family reunion. And when I was talking about chemical bonds to my students, I always got out that December 10th issue of Chemical Engineering News with the Pauling family all smiling happily together in Stockholm, and said, this is a happy family, not just a screwball scientist, but a happy family. These are important things to get across to your students. The human side of science is a terribly important thing to get across to them, as well as what's in the book. Give them what's in you and be sure that what you give them is worthwhile giving. <laughs>